Hey guys, I'm here with President Brown. I feel very honored to be sitting next to you. Happy homecoming. Thank you. Happy homecoming to you. Happy homecoming to everybody. Thank you. How does it feel to be at your first homecoming at Monmouth University? Uh, it feels great. It feels great, particularly when I see all the students here and I see students from the past too. It feels really great. What are you most looking forward to to our homecoming today? Well, of course, a football win, uh, a big win. Uh, but also just lots of uh, MU alums coming back, having a great time, remembering our institution, remember as an MU alum for life. That's great. Well, it's so great to have you here. Did you bring the family? Who are you here with? And my wife's here. My wife's here somewhere. Um, what we get to do is meet lots of people during the homecoming. So she's here. Um, we'll have a full day of meeting all sorts of new people, which is great. That's great. Well, it's so great to have you here. We're excited. Are you ready for the game? I'm absolutely ready for the game. Now, you have to get the spirit going here, so to make sure we have a big win coming up. It's your obligation. Uh, well, I can try my best. I can't promise anything. Okay. Well, have fun. Enjoy the game, and I'm sure we'll see you around. We got prizes. We got food. Make sure to check everything out. All right? All right, so we're going to we're gonna head back to Sports Desk. Let's see what some updates they got going on about the game. Thank you. The Monmouth Hawks have been firing on offense on all cylinders over the last month. Gifford? What have, been, what have the Hawks been doing on offense that has been so efficient? Well, when you talk about the Hawks' offense, it's going to start and end with their running game. They have two very good running backs in KB Asante and Julian Hayes. Earlier in the year, they went four straight games of over, having over 100 yards each. A lot of times you want one of your backs to have 100 yards in a game. They have both of them going over 100 yards in consecutive games. But I think when running the football... It's, it's not just the running backs, it's the offensive line. There's a veteran offensive line. They're all returning stars, and three of them are fifth-year seniors. So they have two very talented running backs, but the offensive line that can consistently open holes for the running backs as well. Yeah. So, Oops, yep. sorry, Joe. It was, sorry. Yeah, it was, it was four <laughs> games in a row, as Gifford has four mentioned. That it was four games in a row we saw KB and Julian rush for 100 yards apiece. To see that come out of your offense, how, how are you going to lose football games taking all that momentum, taking all that time off of the clock? It's just awesome for the Hawks' offense right now. But there is other parts of the offense. Well, to build on what Gifford was saying as well, too, I think the offensive line deserves a ton of credit. You know, they're, they don't really get much of the glory in sports, but they are the guys that open the holes up front, and they're the ones that protect the quarterbacks. And the Hawks have had such great continuity on their offensive line this year. Like you said, they're, a lot of the guys, they're older guys, but they've had the same five guys out there starting every game this year which is huge for an offensive line. Once you have to you know, fill guys in and have missing pieces, things kind of start to go wrong. But when you have the same five guys every game, it makes life a lot easier for your team. And when they gel together, it's something really special. You talked about four games in a row with the two guys going over 100 yards. Well, that's a f the first time it's happened in 20 years here at Monmouth University. It's only happened four times in the history of the school. And to do it four straight games in a row is unbelievable. Yeah, it's, it's, aw it's awesome to see that part of the offense, but to, si to go on what Joe was just saying, we saw Hunchak go down with an injury earlier in the year against Lehigh, and you saw Coach Callahan want him, want him to get back on the field as soon as possible. He knows how important that that offensive line is to the rest of the team. He keeps him on the field at all times, always gelling getting the momentum, and taking it down in the trenches. I well, think one of the most underrated aspects uh, on the offensive side is uh, line communication. I think when you have veterans who know this system and play together game after game, I think communication gets a lot better. Where the blitz pickups are, what the assignments are, that's very underrated. And not only is this, this veteran team understands the system, they understand where they need to be. If you have some younger guys in there, you have issues uh, picking up blitzes, picking up assignments. But because it's a veteran offensive line, they've, they're very good mm -hmm. in that aspect. Absolutely. And, and to build on what Jordan said before about Hunchek, he's the center. So the center and the quarterback really work hand in hand to call out those protections, see where the blitz is coming from. And with Mammoth, with the new quarterback this year, Hill, you know, coming from coming in from a transfer from UMass, you know, you have it's good to have a veteran presence like Hunchek and the rest of the offensive line to ease you along in the process of learning a new offense and helping you to see what the defense is doing because Hill didn't play a whole lot at UMass, so he's coming in. That was part of the reason why he transferred here to Monmouth, was that he wanted an opportunity to play, and he's getting that here at Monmouth, and he's starting to build upon that as well this season. Yeah, Hill saw it early in the season. He had what some people call happy feet. He was, he was a little nervous. He was being a little nervous back there at the quarterback position. He's starting to adjust into this offense, take advantage, and make it his own. Brandon Hill has been stepping up 
as weeks progress, we've just been seeing him getting better and better as the season progresses. Yeah, and specifically, I mentioned it before in our first segment about Mammoth's game versus Lehigh. That was a game where you really saw the potential with, with Hill. He, had, he set career highs for touchdowns, completions, and attempts in that game, and he really developed a rapport with his number one wide receiver in that game. And uh, Gifford, you can tell us more about Neil Sterling, about how, what he's meant to the Hawks offense this year. Right. Uh, we can't go talking about the Hawks offense without talking about, in my opinion, their best player on offense, Neil Sterling, is just an electric wide receiver for them, makes plays down the field, and is really a strong weapon in the red zone. Uh, when I did the game against Robert Morris, a huge uh, part of that game was Neil Sterling in the red zone. Not only is he a huge target, athletic, can go up and get a ball, but in the red zone, other teams have to bring a safety over to help him, uh, help the cornerback on Neil Sterling, so that opens up other options for the offense. You'll see Coach Callahan do it all the time, Gifford, going off of what you were saying. They expect, they expect KB Asante, and they expect Julian Hayes on a majority of the offense. So you'll see Coach Callahan often just dump it out to Neil Sterling, and Neil Sterling does a lot with it. He moves, he moves around, he's fast, he's agile, and he makes yards out of nothing plays. That screen pass has been the bread and butter of this Hawks offense. And with Sterling being such a big guy at 6'4", 230 pounds, he's almost built more like a tight end than a wide receiver. So he's got great size, and you said just get the ball in his hands, let the guy make plays. He has 35 catches this year in seven games, which is five a game. So like you said, they're going to try any way possible to get the ball in his hands. He leads the team in catches, yards, touchdowns. He's been... Hill's security blanket, so to speak. So when the Hawks do go to the air, he's been the main guy. But they also do have a couple other targets. And, you know, another guy has stepped up the past couple games, and Davenport has caught a couple touchdowns for them. Yeah, Lamar Davenport has been great. He's been a great out for Hill, being a small guy on the outside. He's been all over the place. And whenever Hill needs him, he just happens to be there. You'll see him make those small plays late in the quarter, maybe five, six-yard chunks, but he's there all the time. Right. When opposing defenses go up against the Hawks, they know about Neil Sterling. They know they need to cover him. He's going to be one of the main things they try and shut down. So uh, somebody else needs to step up for the offense to be able to catch balls, and Thaddeus Richards has done that throughout the year. And like you said, Lamar Davenport, and that's really important for this offense that they want to double-team Neil Sterling, send a safety over to try and help out the cornerback. Somebody else needs to step up. Uh, catch some third down passes, and Lamar Davenport has really done that this yeah, year. Yeah, Lamar Davenport has done that very often, but another person coming out of the slot playing sort of the Wes Welker role, as we see him often, is Eric Sumlin. Sumlin's been coming out third down. He loves to get, he'll loves to look for him. He knows he, he has a great possession receiver who doesn't attract a lot of attention, who's going to be open on those third downs often. It's always nice to have a guy in the slot who can, who can get a, win a one-on-one -on -one matchup for your quarterback when, you know, kind of when all else fails, when you have a third and five, like you said, like the Wes Welker type. You know, me growing up, the Wayne Krebet guy who's always open on third down. So it's great for a quarterback to have such a bevy of targets. But for Monmouth, again, it starts with the running game, I think, here. Monmouth has lived and died with the running game this year so far. 58% to 42% so far has been their, pa their run-to-pass ratio. So for them, again, today, against a Cornell defense who we haven't really started to talk yeah. about, which we'll get into now, that has struggled so far this year. They won their first game, but they have struggled mightily to defend the run and the pass. They're giving up 200 yards a game on the ground. You know, they're giving up over 30 points a game total so this can be a potential big matchup for the Monmouth offense today you might see them put up a lot of points yeah it'll be about time to see them explode especially against an offense like you said letting up 31 and a half points per game coach Callahan's gonna have to find a way to take complete advantage of that it, as much as he can especially in that secondary they are str Cornell struggles in the back right I think Monmouth has a lot of weapons on offense we already talked about them and I think you need a really strong defense to be able to stop everybody and I'm not certain that Cornell has the ability to consistently stop Monmouth on the offensive side of the ball so I think when you look at this game right now you're gonna see Monmouth score I think they can run the ball and if Cornell steps up to try and stop the run they're gonna have options through the air yeah there's no reason why Monmouth shouldn't be able to score the football today Cornell's given up at least 34 points in their last three games all losses you know not coincidentally they've all, which is I thought was amazing looking at the Cornell schedule so far this year they didn't play their first game till September 21st yeah they were, they were that, late. that's pretty rare isn't it yeah they, they didn't pick up they didn't pick up until late in the season so they're still trying to find their feet a little bit they're, they're struggling you could see that, that you could see they're progressively getting better but they started off extremely slow in those first couple of games. Yeah, and like I said, 34, at least 34 points a game in the past 
three. They're coming off a loss at Harvard the previous week where they lost 34-24, to a game where, again, you're going to see this trend with Cornell. We'll talk about their offense in a little bit, where, but the offense was really carrying Cornell, which is going to have to be the case for them here again today against the Hawks because I do see the Hawks putting up a lot of points. This Cornell defense, I said, 200 yards a game on the ground. They're giving up 451 total yards a game they've given up so far this year. For me, the, the Monmouth Hawks, two running backs, Asante, uh, and Hayes got to be looking their chops right now. Yeah, and you, they have to do it early. They have to do it extremely early in this game. It's going to come down to you. Brandon Hill has to stay on the field. They don't want to have to get to Greg Depew to come in and back him up as they did in the last game because Hill was having a little bit of a struggle. He was 4 for 16 last game with a pick and no touchdowns. So th he's going to have to get his confidence early to get back in this ball game. Yeah, I think Brandon Hill has been up and down a lot throughout the years. He flashes of a really good quarterback, and then there's times where he doesn't quite show that. I think early in this game, Monmouth should run up on uh, some slants, some screen passes, kind of get Brandon Hill into the flow of the game a little bit, and then things will open up, and he, I think he can make uh, plays down the field, especially against this Cornell defense. And he, uh, he should have some time to throw as well. Uh, the Cornell defense has only registered six sacks so far in four games, so they haven't gotten a ton of pressure on the quarterbacks. But just a stat to throw out there, the Cornell defense has forced nine fumbles so far in their, in their four games. That's a lot, and they've recovered six of them. So ball securities can definitely be at a premium for the Hawks today. Uh, the Hawks have been great all year, keeping the ball on their side. They haven't been turning it over too often, but again, that comes down to the quarterback play. It's, it depends who we're going to see today, what side of Brandon Hill. But... We'll see that coming up soon, but right now I'm going to send it back over to the desk for Alex and Bray. Thank you to our guys over at the sports desk. Once again, since our theme is Mama Through the Ages, we're going to talk a little bit more about our campus history and our school's history. Mm -hmm. Well, Wilson Hall was constructed in 1903 and housed 52 rooms, and President Woodrow Wilson lived there during his campaign in the summer of 1916. The film Annie was also filmed on campus in Wilson Hall in 1980. Yeah, right on the right on the steps. She the did her tap scene. Yes. <laughs> and Coach Callahan has been the only football coach in all of our school history. Yeah. And this is our 21st annual homecoming. It's a lot of dedication. Yeah. The first points in school's history for the football team were scored on an interception return on a two-point conversion. Train, Martina McBride, and Old Time Low are just some of the famous musical acts to come here and play at the MAC. Christy Rampone, United States Women's National Soccer Team captain, and Miles Austin, wide receiver on the wide receiver on the Dallas Cowboys, are just two more of the famous Mammoth alums. I know. I just gotta say, it's a beautiful day today. Look at all the fans we got out here. I know this we is have great. a huge crowd, a huge turnout. And Last you know, year, it was exactly, nothing like this. Everybody's cheering. It's awesome. And you know what? This is what homecoming's all about: the life and the spirit of Monmouth University. And not only from our students, but from all the families and just friends who have other people coming down to see homecoming and visiting people. It's, it's, it's such a nice atmosphere, and it really creates a school spirit and just so much fun and it's so much hype for the game. It really is exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're gonna. Throw it over to Ashley, who's over at the comm department tent. Uh, what's going on over there, Ashley? Hi, guys. Over, like you said, at the comm department tent here with Professor Voinovich and Professor Shamrock. How are you guys doing today? Great. Good. Lots of people here. Yes. Now, tell me, your tent looks amazing. What was the inspiration behind this? Because it's flawless. Well, it's a great group of professors, as you know, getting together and just thinking through what we can do for this um, great theme. In fact, in the beginning we were a little bit like, how can we do all of these decades and represent them fairly? And then ideas just came popping up, so perhaps Jennifer can tell you a little bit more about these uh, great ideas we had. So we came up with the idea of the banners with the television shows and media throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. So we found TV shows that were popular for each one of those decades and put the banners together. And so there's a banner on each side of the tent, one for the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and then found decorations like the hot rod cars and the jukebox and the peace signs for the 70s. I mean, this is clearly not a last minute project. This is something that you guys worked very hard on, dedicated all your time to. About how long did this take? Um, 
It would be hard to estimate the hours, but all of us contributed. And Marina, Professor Boyanovich, and I would spend time at her house working on the banners and putting together, d deciding what we were going to do, and going and getting candy, and coming up with the Pez dispensers, and ordering the food. And so we would meet on campus. And but we, as soon as we get the idea of what the theme is, we start meeting and discussing what we're going to do for our plans. So you guys have a little girls night get together and you know put your creative heads together. I love it. Now we have an interactive like portion of your tent. Can you tell me a little bit about this guess your professor MU through the decades game? We thought it would be fun and have students choose who they think the different professors are from when we were all younger and we thought that that would go well with the theme of Monmouth through the decades so we asked all the faculty in the communication department if they would give us photos. We didn't tell them what decade it had to be from, just anything from childhood up through say college or before they got to Monmouth. So everybody submitted photos and we put them on the poster boards here and then I put the names but we covered up the names hoping that students would guess. Excellent. Is there any any perimeter? I mean, are there are these new professors, people who have been here for years? What's what's kind of the the deal here? We've got everybody from people that have been here from 30, 20 years ago to people that just came last year. So anybody from the department that wanted to submit a photo could submit a photo and and we put them together. All right, excellent. So let's see. I think we have some very, very daring uh, alumni over here. Come over here, guys. Come on in. So please introduce yourself. Uh, Felipe. And I'm Mike Brown. All right. Hi, guys. So you heard a little bit about this game. You have to guess what professor is in these photos. So let me get out of your way. That's, that's got to that's gotta be Chris. That's uh, Chris Cavallaro right there. Let's see. Professor Cavallaro, you're right. Yeah, that's a, that's a face. Uh, he still looks like that. <laughs> so adorable. Okay, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say the guy with the fish is Professor Rob Scott. No way. Rob Scott fishing? Never. Oh. Oh, you are the winner. And look, there's Pez, Pez candies, other candies, prizes, right? Pez can I'm going to go with some Pez candy. Excellent. Well, let's see here. Yes, Pop Rocks, of course. I think that's, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really know too many other faces. I think I'm going to walk away with the Pez and call it a day. You know what, I think you guys did an absolutely great job. Thank you to the comm department for creating such a great tent and interactive game for everyone. That's it over here.